Welcome to In the Open with Luke and Joe. I'm your host, Luke Schantz, and here's my co-host, Joe Seppi, and a big welcome to our special guest, Mo Hagigi. Before we get to our show, don't forget to like and subscribe. In this episode of In the Open, we bring you a conversation with Mo Hagigi, IBM's hybrid cloud build leader in EMEA. We will be discussing a variety of topics, including hybrid cloud, DevOps, Kubernetes, OpenShift, edge computing, developer relations, and open source software. Before we welcome our guest, let's say hello to my co-host, Joe Seppi. Hello, Luke. How are you, my friend? How's, uh, how's the weather over there where you're at? I'm doing well, Joe, and I, I was prepared today. I knew you were going to ask me about the weather, <laughs> so I went on to uh, the Weather Channel, and I looked it up, and apparently this month is a, se- a bit seasonally warm. Uh, it's going to be in the 60s and the, the, the low 70s through the, the middle of the month, which is uh, apparently uh, a little high for the, uh, you know, the historical log. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's amazing. So you just don't get out of that room. You have no idea what's going on in the outside world. You have to go on the Weather Channel and be like, oh, what's going on out there? That, oh. that is very much so the case. <laughs> I, I, uh, I don't need to wear a sunblock because I, I never see the sun. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Uh, well, you should get out more. Uh, it is nice out. It's gorgeous out. It's, I love this weather because I have a lot of light jackets that I really enjoy. However, I don't have them here at this, uh, at my office here. So I need to go grab some and have light jackets so that I'm prepared to enjoy this lovely fall weather. It's quite nice. You've been teasing us with this, these light jackets all season. And now (laughs) we have not seen one. I, I'm even wondering if you own a jacket. Let's see how the weather is across the pond, as they say. And welcome our guest, Mo. Hello, Mo. Hey, good afternoon, guys. Glad to be How here. are you, Mo? How's the weather over there? Okay, you know, in London, you never know what the weather's going to be like, you know. Once you're here, it's just, it's, it is mostly mild, but it never gets super hot, super cold. But one thing is certain, it varies significantly, you know, even, you know, from hour to hour. Um, you know, it was pretty chilly last night, and I had to actually take my winter coat with me. And a couple of weeks ago, it was quite warm, around 27 degrees Celsius. And this morning, it was all cloudy, gray, and gloomy, and now it's actually sunny again. So, yeah, it's London. You never know what's that going to be like. <laughs> it does look really bright there. It looks like it's super sunny right now. Which, yeah, which right nice. now. Yeah, just just, yeah. just it started like <laughs> an hour ago. We'll see what happens near the end of the broadcast, what it looks like. Yeah. Fun. Good to it see you. Fun. How are you doing? How's New York? New York's great. New York's great. Yeah, I split my time between New York and Connecticut. Mm-hmm. So Luke and I are kind of uh, neighbors in, in the Connecticut area, but I'm, I'm over here in New York right now. But it's good. It's really nice. It's, uh, it's been enjoyable. Awesome. I love your guitars. You know, the old Thank you. On the wall. <laughs> I will say. So where do we want to begin? You want to you want to tell us a little bit uh, about you and what you're doing, and and we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you you know me well. I, I'm a technologist. I've been fascinated by technology and electronics, and and you know, ever since my childhood, basically. So you know, when I got my first computer at the age of ten, <laughs> and um, yeah, currently I, I lead IBM Developer Ecosystem and Hybrid Cloud um, um, Build Team in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Uh, previously, I worked as a research scientist at Intel and, and as a Java developer and advocate at Sun Microsystem before that. And, and obviously, that happened right before the acquisition of Sun by Oracle. And that was a great opportunity for me, actually, to get into research. And, and, I, and I did my PhD and a couple of postdocs um, in computer science and, and telecom. Uh, yeah, is, it, <laughs> is that a good introduction? I can actually, I, I mentioned, uh, you know, I've been fascinated by technology. Um, but, you know, that, that all started when I was a kid, uh, you know, with my first computer. You know, computers to me were all about power to create things. Uh, you know, when I first, uh, you know, when I wrote my first code in, in basics, in basic programming language, I was absolutely blown away by how a few lines of code uh, could calculate a fairly sophisticated formula. I mean, in that age, and I remember I had a like a bunch of LEDs connected to the parallel port. If you remember that, you know, the, the one that we used to connect the printers to. Um, and then once it, one day, once they all started flashing, 
on and off it, you know, sending ASCII characters. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Yeah, and that basically stayed with me um, all along. And yeah, I can go, you know, more into details when I started working with C and Java and that changed my world basically. Yeah, that's interesting. I, you know, I hear a lot of stories about people uh, messing around with computers when they were younger back in the day. I, I, I started late, so I didn't get into it until, you know, the late nineties. Um, and it just so happened, like I could tell the whole story another time, but uh, my buddy got a computer cause he got a, a job working with computers. And I was like, what's this internet thing? How does this work? And, and then just kind of, you know, went down the rabbit hole there and got into it. But, but yeah, I, I, I have to admit, I'm a little envious of people who like had it when they were young and just really have been enthusiastic the whole time. So that's great. Mo, what was that first computer? Was it a Spectrum? No, no, it was a Pentium 100, if I remember correctly. Well, you know, actually, the first computer was an IBM PC that my dad had, uh, but I never actually worked with it. But I saw it. I, I saw that IBM, you know, logo. Uh, and, and, you know, that's, um, you know, when people say about the power of, uh, you know, you know, manif manifestation, um, you know, that's real. You know, you can harness that, you know, your desire, you, you know, no matter how far-fetched or unlikely they seem but they actually turn into reality by envisioning that because you know i worked for intel because when i first my you know when i got my first computer it was an intel pentium and i was like wow this is amazing and i always wanted to work for that company and i ended up working for intel and then ibm pc was my dad's computer and i basically ended up working for ibm and the funny thing is um you know after i learned java i followed up on other products and services. And, and obviously I ended up working for Sun Microsystems. And basically Java was something that literally changed my life. You know, I was I was actually gonna say this. Um, um, you know, when I learned C, C++ and, and Java, and you know, learning Java was that turning point uh, for me because the power of object-oriented architecture, inheritance, and the bytecode and the JVM, you know, what JVM did. Um, you know, write it once, run it anywhere. You know, that was, like, you know, wow, no, no limit to creativity. I basically, I could create anything I wanted at that age. And, and, and that really kind of, you know, changed my life. Cause I was like, you know, this is, this is the sort of thing that I want to do for the rest of my life. I want to be a creator and I want to help others become creators. And, and here I am, you know, it's just, uh, you know, um, so many things happened after that. Like, you know, when I woke for Sun and I met James Gosling and so many great people, I was like, oh my God, this is so surreal. So but yeah, it just um, it, it works, you know, that manifestation, you know, just have to envision it. Yeah, I, I, it's really interesting. I think, you know, I, I have a 12 year old son and, uh, you know, we dabble with computers together and I, it's fun to see his eyes light up when and we were doing an LED light thing with some, uh, you know, um, uh, Arduino stuff. But I think this is maybe a good segue even into like DevRel. You know, what do what do you do? when you're engaging folks, you know, at any age, I guess, uh, to get them excited. I know, I know you've been doing DevRel for a while. What's, what's, what's your approach? Um, you know, for the, you know, I, I, let, let me start it this way. Advocacy, you know, that's, that's what we do. And that's what we, the three of us actually do at IBM uh, in, in different forms, basically. And some, you know, focused on open source, some focused on clients and partners, some of us, on the offering management, some of us, some of us on the editorial and digital content creation, but advocacy is all about building that honest relationship with developers and educate them on the latest and you know most relevant technologies, and and enable them to build their own solutions, uh, you know, with as little friction as possible. That's the way I define as advocacy. Uh, this has been our mission for the past four and a half years at IBM, and you know we've run thousands of sessions on a variety of technologies all around the globe. But you know, the, the, the interesting part is, you know, as developer advocates working for IBM, you know, the pioneer of many technologies and inventions with a history of over a century, now it's like 110 years. Um, you know, obviously we have certain messages that we must get to the world, you know, and, and that means to all developers all around the globe as much as possible. So with that, you know, a special methodology, code content community. And, and to going back to your question, it's all about creating the right content for the right audience and making it use case oriented. Because developers, they're very smart. They, they, they know exactly how to approach a problem, how to kind of you know, brainstorm about it and, and turn that into a, a kind of a plan. 
and you know by giving them the uh, use case oriented content um that you're basically expediting their journey and creating that learning educational series like you know that learning journey for them they're going to basically love it and stay with you and 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 kind of go through the entire journey with you and that has been like our secret i think for the past you know four and a half years because we've created a ton of content like in digital form like code repositories tutorials blogs and i think we enable like you know the fact that we were just focused on the technology and we put ibm and the brand next we basically taught them here's how you can do this in you know on kubernetes but if you want to do it with ibm here's iks if you want to do it with openshift here's openshift on ibm cloud and it basically we left it to them to you know to decide whether they want to do it with ibm or one of our competitors and that honest you know kind of approach to problem solving and to education and enablement i think that has been our most you know sort of uh, that that's been our biggest success basically uh, you know um, out of all the other points and and one thing i can add to that is just uh, you know being authentic you know if you are going to be out there talking to developers um we want to you know show them how they can do things like hands on and and it's just like you know avoiding as much tech talk as possible because you know there's so many content out there people talking about lots of theories and lots of ways of doing things and we basically try to focus on you know the best way to solve a problem and create a solution and and i think that that approach works very well because developers they want to get to that solution very quickly they don't want to waste time and they want to focus on coding rather than you know focus on you know how to you know kind of install these libraries and all the dependencies and we always focused on getting that to them in the most efficient way possible with as you know you know uh, as little friction as possible and i think those are the things that i think it would definitely work with kids and 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 children as well because they if we try to simplify it based on use cases like the leds that was a very good example you know they see things they see things happening and that's how they get interested and they start kind of imagining how they can actually relate the same solution to something else they have in mind and they can customize it and it's just having the right education on the side could basically help them get there that's the way i look at it yeah and and, and uh, that was really well well said and and i agree 1000% and um you know if if anybody's out there and wanting to learn about you know developer relations developer advocacy and how to build community like follow mo because we were we were joking in one of the prep calls luke and i <clears throat> luke and i worked in the new york city team and and mo was running the, the london team and it was always like look at all look at all the stuff that mo is doing look at what the his team is doing they're like you know gangbusters over there and uh <laughs> luke and i were always really impressed for sure that's very kind of you to say that, Joe. But you know, I know you're not a Java developer, so I was like, you know, when I mentioned Java, he's <laughs> probably gonna say, "Oh, what are you talking about? Let's talk about, you know, no, probably." Yeah, um, it, it's funny. I, I, so I came, I came from programming from the other side. Like I said, I I found a website, you know, websites. I'm like, how does this work? And so I got into it like by reading HTML and like figuring out CSS and then doing some design and building websites for my bands and for my friends' bands and stuff like that. So I came very much from the front end. And I remember like the first kind of real job that I had where I was a part of a, a development team and the back end was in Java. And I was just like, keep that away from me. I and, and we used to joke all the time, we'd be playing foosball and, and the boss would come in and we're like, we're compiling. Sorry, we're just, we're, you know, it's gonna be 40 minutes or something. I was just like, this is insane. So yeah, I, I do, when you talk about Java, I, I just shake my head. And, 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 <laughs> and if I want to add one more point to what you mentioned about like, you know, uh, the advocacy, I, I should say like, you know, again, you know, Luke, you and I, we've been at a lot of conferences and a lot of events, basically developer events in New York, in London, San Francisco. I think last, last time we got together in San Francisco, that was a fun event. Um, you know, we, we do advocacy, you know, using that code content community, that methodology, which basically gives the developers the, the sort of code uh, that they need to, you know, kind of start their solution. The content is basically all the blog posts, all the videos, the tutorials that we got on developer.ibm.com. And the community is basically us, uh, developer advocates, and a lot of federated developer advocates across <clears> IBM. <throat> and we try to be out there, you know, uh, you know, speaking at various developer conferences, major tech events, 
digital channels like this one, you know, contributing to many open source projects. You know, that's one of the things that not many people actually know what IBM is doing for open source. It's just like we are out there more than any other company, like contributing to a ton of, you know, open source work. And, you know, at the same time, you know, not only we do that outbound work, but also the inbound. And that's actually quite important. You have to be out there talking to users who's got their hands on the technology to get their feedback and pain points. And bring that information back to product management and engineering teams to improve the products. So the user experience basically becomes much better and vastly superior. And that's basically that combination of outbound and inbound activities basically defined who we are. And that's what keeps us enthusiastic. Like you know, right now, we've got together to talk about what we can do for hybrid cloud with OpenShift, with Kubernetes, with you know, lots of other open source products. And, and that basically makes, you know, us enthusiastic to make even better and deeper impact. So I thought it's actually important for uh, our audience to know that it's not just about the outbound, it's also the inbound. And a lot of companies who are making a major difference, you know, in terms of their products and services, uh, you know, is because of that developer to de developer relations and getting that honest feedback. Because if developers have a good experience with your products and services, they're going to tell everyone about it, all their peers, and they're all going to start working with your products and services. And that's why DevRel is very important. And that's what DevRel basically is what brought us all together for the past four and a half years. We've been working as one team. I mean, you're saying, Joe, that you were looking at London. We were looking at North America, you, Max, Katz, and others. Like, you were doing an amazing job, even in Austin, that we didn't have a proper team there. But like the open source team, they were doing an amazing job running all those events. But like, look at Mia, look at APAC. You know, we are all all around the globe, basically. Yeah, so true, so true. That is something I must say that is amazing about working for a, a, a global company that has this kind of commitment to developer relations is you can always, you can check in on Slack, you can check in on Twitter, you can see all this amazing work that's going on. And it's like, we're all living these these parallel lives and kind of in, encountering the same sort of scenarios. And the last thing I wanna comment on this bef before we maybe move on to hybrid cloud is, as you mentioned, you know, going out there, educating the community, really relating, being authentic. What I find amazing about this is, you know, if we have knowledge, we have technology, we have this information, we can share it. It doesn't cost us anything, right? Like for sharing that, but it creates this value in the ecosystem and the community. And I would say even to expand that from developer relations, just to community building in general, because sometimes it's also about, hey, you know who you, you need to meet is this person or look what they're working on. So it's like, by working with the community, there's like so many ways, whether it's the technology or making those introductions, we can really create value for everybody, but it doesn't use up our resource. It's like we're a, a catalyst or an enzyme that can kind of just keep giving and creating more value. I love it. Exactly. And it's a small community. Like, you know, you come across people like all the time, you know, on, on LinkedIn, on social media, but like at the same time in conferences, like, hey, I, I know you. I met you like two years ago at that conference. And it's just like, you know, we have that power to connect people. You're like directories, you know, <laughs> for, for you know, if I if somebody comes to me and say, hey, I want to know more about Node.js and, you know, what I can do in open source, Joe is your man, you know, you can talk to him. But that's, that's how we, we do things. And, you know, if they go to him and say, I need someone with Java, he's not going to send them to anyone. But yeah, he's fine. <laughs> <laughs> We might send them to Mary Gergleski these days. She's yeah. close. she's just closer, more closer time zone. But now you're you're our alternate. Now that we know that you're the you have the Java <laughs> roots, an amazing job in Chicago. Like you know, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, no, fantastic. I actually need to go visit her. Um, I love it out in Chicago. Uh, so yeah, before we move on, I I just want to emphasize to that cycle. You know, the 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 feedback loop, being out the community, taking the experience back to the product team. I mean, that's like key. Um, and, and again, you know, there's the website, uh, folks check it out. If you have any questions or want to talk more about it, you can reach out to any of us. My, my Twitter DMS are open or, or whatnot. I hope that you find it valuable and, and let us know what you think. So Mo, what have you been doing lately? What's, what's your current story? Let's talk about that. <laughs> sure. Um, you know, having that, having had a, a great success with developer advocacy is, you know, we um, managed to bring so many developers on IBM cloud. Um, we had to evolve our mission, you know, into something more tangible for our clients and partners. They wanted us to help them with their time to market. Basically, they wanted to kind of, you know, improve that because they always wanted to, you know, want to be ahead of their competitors. And what we are doing, you know, we are doing that by helping them co-create their solutions, you know, with our amazing team of developers, architects, and data scientists. So right now in EMEA, we have a team of over 100 developer advocates. 
and architects, data scientists, um, you know, from London to Paris, Milan, Madrid, Berlin, Prague, Istanbul, and Dubai, you know, across 27 countries. We have so many other countries, but it's just like 27 countries, we have teams. And, and basically, Hybrid Cloud Build Team enables partners, clients, and developers, basically, to develop the skills they need to build solutions uh, with IBM's open hybrid cloud technology. And um, we basically do that by partnering with them through architectural whiteboard sessions, you know, hands-on workshops. You have workshops happening every day on Crowdcast, sometimes on Twitch, sometimes on YouTube and on WebEx and Zoom. And we basically co-create MVPs, you know, um, you know, POCs to accelerate their time to market. And that's basically what we've been focused on. But the, you know, advocacy is still there. So advocacy is the, is the you know, you know, for creating this sort of, for, you know, to co-create solutions with partners, you need to have deep knowledge, deep skills, and at the same time, having that expertise of developer to developer relations, that is our expertise as developer advocates. We built that, you know, before the, the whole hybrid car build team was formed. And now we are basically using that expertise with our deep technical knowledge to help partners. And mostly the partners are actually looking for, you know, hybrid and multi-cloud solutions. And the majority of our focus is focused on that. And, and that's, that's been working very well. We've, in EMEA, we've had over 150 partners this year, like, you know, um, creating solutions with IBM, with OpenShift, with, you know, uh, you know, Red Hat products and IBM products. And it's been a great journey. Uh, and at the same time, we keep all the advocacy activities, you know, live and active. And, you know, we've got so many events happening and we are creating lots of tutorials and videos at the same time for the community. So that, you know, those two are now going in parallel, which actually makes it quite interesting because you see partners and clients actually creating solutions right there. So it's not just about that long tail approach to advocacy that you see startups basically attending your workshop and then six months later, maybe they create a solution with you. Now we see that in a, on a weekly basis, we help a partner create a solution and then they provide it to their clients. We see it right there, that client, that solution is out there for people to start kind of, you know, using that. And that gives us a lot of, uh, you know, kind of, you know, how do you say, like recognition because we help them build that solution. That solution is our work, you know, and our partner's work. Yeah, that must be exciting, you know, being engaged at that level and helping them build and, and see it happen and, and, you know, enjoy it together. That's great. And I, I, I could see how that would help feed that, that close that feedback loop we were talking about, too. It's like, you know, you, you can keep your finger on the pulse by giving talks and reading blogs and being out there. But if you're actually working on things that are relevant with mm -hmm. clients and partners right now, how tight is that feedback loop? That That's awesome. Yeah, exactly. And And, and, and again, it's not just about creating a solution, a solution, you know, one solution leads to more solutions, you know, in, in, in a very short time. And it's just because the, 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 the pace of technology is like so fast these days that you can't really like, you know, we've had this partner who created a, an amazing solution with IBM and they basically provided that to their clients and their clients basically came back saying like, this is amazing. How did you manage to get this out in less than four weeks? We want more of that. And we started creating solutions for their clients. And this is happening like on a, it's actually accelerating. That's why hopefully next year we are gonna have a, a much you know bigger team uh, because we are now kind of at a at a point that the capacity is like right there. You know, we, we, we work with one client and then the pipe is actually getting filled again. Um so yeah, it's quite interesting to see that happening. Yeah, this is exciting. And I think this is an exciting time too for our for our you know team, our org, our, our for IBM. I mean, we're talking about um the hybrid cloud build team today. And I'm just gonna tease uh next week, which I think we have an off uh time week. Is is it like Wednesday at uh noon? Correct me if I'm wrong, uh Luke. But I we while you're, you're while you're looking. I, I, yeah. <laughs> We're going to talk with someone else too. That's uh, uh, you know really working with uh, clients and building stuff too. That I'm excited about. I won't I won't say much more than that because uh, I think we we need to. Uh, yeah, it's, go ahead. It's, Luke. it's it's Tuesday at three. Tuesday at three. Tuesday at three. <laughs> yeah, Eastern 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 time. Uh great. So definitely tune into that. I'm wondering too if before we move on, Mo, maybe we should just unpack a little bit for our listeners about hybrid cloud and multi-cloud sort of, I think these terms are becoming more popular, but 
maybe we could help define them and, and contextualize them. Yeah, I was going to ask the same question because you use the term open hybrid cloud. And you mentioned multi-cloud. I'd love to hear you define hybrid and multi-cloud, but also uh, share the open part as well. And I, I think it would be great for our listeners. Um, absolutely. So it, it, you know, the way I can actually describe it is this. Uh, it all comes down to uh, uh, one important concept, portability. You know, for, for developers, uh, it's all about productivity. For operation engineers, it's all about security and cost reduction. For execs, are basically, they're interested in cost reduction. And at the same time, they want to provide that business flexibility to their clients and delight them with new and competitive features. Um, but, you know, developers are looking for ways to expedite their journey from development to testing you know, staging and production. Operation engineers are motivated to simplify the operation, increase the security, and reduce the cost, obviously. Uh, but, you know, for the last decade or so, there's been this new team, which sits somewhere between developers and operation engineers, known as DevOps. And they've almost replaced, uh, you know, developers and operation teams in many firms, smaller firms, medium-sized firms. And for the DevOps teams, it's all about portability. That is the number one factor. And as I will say it later, if you want, I can actually say that, you know, why OpenShift actually meets all those requirements. But let me just, you know, dig deeper into that, you know, portability. Um, you know, many companies, especially large enterprises, use multiple clouds to run their business critical workloads. Um, so, you know, multiple cloud platforms enable them to shift their workload on one side and also their applications and services across several platforms to avoid downtime and you know, boost scalability. So these are obvious. In addition, they need to have the compute uh, you know, to run where the data resides. That's, that's for a lot of reasons, like you know, for legal, security, and governance uh, you know, um, you know, reasons, data often you know, must not leave companies' own data centers. Um, or for GDPR purposes, the you know, data and compute must happen on the same cloud platform. So those are the reasons that sometimes they need to have multiple, you know, multi-cloud solutions. You know, if they've got a solution on one public cloud and suddenly they come across a, 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 a client that uh, hosts their client data on another public cloud, um, it basically means that they've got to rewrite the entire application from scratch or kind of, you know, um, uh, adapt it to, to, to the new cloud platform. And that means also having multiple teams with different, you know, kind of, you know, with cloud platform specific skills to um, kind of, you know, keep all these solutions in parallel, to keep maintaining all these solutions in parallel. That's not efficient. You want to have a, uh, a you know, you want to have this sort of model that you build your solution once and you can run it on any public cloud or even on your on-prem facility. That's, that's why hybrid and multi-cloud matters. As for the workload, it really depends on the workload as well, you know. It's all about matching the right workload to the right cloud environment. Some public cloud providers offer wider availability zones. Uh, some of them, they have faster provisioning. Some of them have shorter downtime. So depending on your workload, if it's like in, in finance, is if it's in, you know, you know, if you are dealing with a large number of transactions, you may need, a, you know, kind of a different cloud platform. And, and you may also need some specific features that make them unique. Uh, you know, and, and that's why you need to have like multiple clouds kind of working like you need to have part of your solutions, uh, different parts of your solutions running on multiple clouds. So those are the reasons. And and that's basically the the whole kind of, you know, when you look at it uh, from the, you know, multi, multiple, uh, you know, cloud providers, you always want to have that sort of solution out there that help people to port their solutions from one cloud platform to another seamlessly. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question. So basically, those are the motivations for having multi and hybrid cloud solutions. And I can tell you more why, you know, for instance, for us, OpenShift is actually the right uh, sort of platform to make that happen. Because there are lots of, you know, there, there, we have like, you know, three or four other uh, platforms. We can actually make that happen. But OpenShift has something very, you know, kind of specific and, and quite unique that make it, you know, kind of the 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 go-to sort of platform for many firms and especially for our clients. Well, I'd like to hear about that. I mean, <laughs> you, you set it up. I mean, you don't leave you me hanging, Mo. Yeah, like, <laughs> tell us. Sure, absolutely. So, you know, for, for developers, they want to get us started on, you know, 
coding as quickly as possible rather than spending time learning about different platform tools and services and how to refactor their applications. Kubernetes is that you know, de facto platform for orchestrating microservices. A lot of uh, firms are basically moving towards cloud native. And for cloud native, you need to have microservices. So you need to uh, kind of um, shift your uh, you know, thinking and your model from that monolith applications into, um, into cloud native. And cloud native means microservices, breaking down your application based on business functionalities and, and basically um, you know, you know, help different teams to evolve different parts of the application on their own time. And, and at the same time, adding features wouldn't basically bring down your solution or make it un unresponsive. Or if parts of your application, the most important feature is if part of your application goes down, it doesn't mean that your entire solution, entire application will go down. And that those are basically the motivations for having cloud native. And another you know, important aspect of cloud native is the fact that you can, you know, you basically package your uh, your microservices with their dependencies and 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 all the requirements. And that basically, you know, using Docker or like you know, Podman and other things, like you containerize your your microservices. And that basically helps your solution, your microservices, to be portable across multiple clouds because they don't have any dependencies and they all have all their dependencies packaged. But for big applications, you know, you have a lot of microservices and orchestrating all those microservices is not an easy job. Kubernetes, as I said, is that de facto platform. I wanted to say, I wanted to talk about Kubernetes first, but I thought it's best to, you know, kind of approach it from the microservices perspective. Kubernetes is that de facto platform for orchestrating microservices and cloud native applications, but it takes many, you know, uh, you know, kind of commands and many steps to uh, containerize your application your microservices and deploy them. And every time you want to update them, every time you want to add a new feature, you've got to do it all over again. And the problem is that Kubernetes and, and different public cloud providers, like, you know, different public clouds, they have like a different version of Kubernetes. Even though Kubernetes is the same, the core is the same, but they come with different plugins, with different add-ons. So every time you want to move your application from one public cloud and another, even though it's on top of Kubernetes, you still need to do that rewrite. And obviously you need to have, you know, Kubernetes on Azure, on IBM, on, on GCP, like they, they defer, they've got their own sort of set of features. And definitely you need to have multiple teams taking care of different versions of Kubernetes. And, you know, OpenShift here is that's, that's the interesting part. Um, OpenShift is built on top of Kubernetes and brings along all the brilliant features of Kubernetes, but it bundles Kubernetes with some essential features that will ultimately provide the best experience to both developers and operation engineers. And that's through a number of automated workflows. Um, and those automated workflows, they're not available in Kubernetes. Those automated workflows are basically are the results of, um, you know, a, an enterprise grade Linux operating system within OpenShift, networking, monitoring, registry, and a lot of authentication and authorization uh, components within uh, OpenShift. And that basically is, is Kubernetes wrapped around all those components. And through all those components, you can actually provide a lot of productivity features to developers, especially like for us, we care about developers. And that basically makes uh, their journey, their sort of experience with the, with, the, with the platform and that portability a seamless sort of experience. And you know, if I want to be like kind of a specific about those features, one of the most distinctive feature of OpenShift is actually is amazing web console. So in Kubernetes, you have this command line interface. You've got to do everything from the CLI. Some public cloud providers have got their own sort of GUI, but again, it's very specific to that public cloud. Whereas with OpenShift, you know, it, you can implement all tasks, almost all tasks from a simple gra graphical user interface, that web console. And you can build, deploy, expose, updates, all those, you know, kind of the steps that you do on Kubernetes. You can implement any task in two separate perspectives of developer and administrator. Developers, obviously, for the developers, and administrator for the for the operation engineers. And everything is just like on your on your browser. Imagine you can do everything from your phone even if you want to. And also, like you know, as I said before, Kubernetes offerings differ from one platform to another, and you know, major cloud providers offer different versions of Kubernetes. But OpenShift, you know, your experience with OpenShift Container Platform stays the same. So the way you interact with the platform is exactly the same across Azure, G 
GCP, AWS, uh, and IBM Cloud. So you don't actually have to learn, you know, kind of, you know, how to work with OpenShift on Azure. It's exactly the same as OpenShift on IBM Cloud. And, and that basically make it, you know, build it once, deploy it anywhere, because you don't have to change anything. And then finally, Kubernetes is basically is, is an open source project. Whereas OpenShift is a product based on an open source project. And it, you know, that's the difference because, you know, uh, you know, I've given that in my video and I've said that many times. Um, I think somebody gave that example uh, at, at Red Hat. Kubernetes, you know, comparing Kubernetes to OpenShift is like that classical example of comparing an engine with a car. You can't do much with an engine. As you know, you can't really get from A to B, and you need to assemble it, uh, you know, with other components in order to make it a car and you know go from A to B and become pro productive. Basically, what you get with OpenShift basically includes enterprise support, ecosystem certification, most importantly, regular releases and security updates. So it's like a car; you just get in and drive, and that's basically the beauty of OpenShift compared, like you know, on top of uh, Kubernetes. There's so many other reasons, like the CI/CD, Tekton, and so many other features that make it quite interesting. But like, I can give you more technical if you want. Shall I make it more technical? What do you guys think? Well, I have one question. How do oh. operators fit into this? Because I remember when we had Brad Topol on, he was sort of explaining to us how, you know, if you have an offering and you want to, you know, sort of be able to offer it easily to enterprise customers, the operator is, is actually a great uh, sort of mechanism to be able to make sure that, yeah. Yeah, no, I just, I want to interject for a quick moment <clears throat> because I, I want to get to operators. I wanted to mention, cause I agree, like the web interface is amazing in, in Red Hat. You know, um, if you go to learn.openshift.com, you can uh, basically go through some journeys and see how powerful and how much you can do with the, the web interface, whether you're coming at it from a developer standpoint or a DevOps standpoint, it's really, it is pretty impressive. So I, I had this because we spoke with Jason uh, uh, Dobbies uh, a few weeks ago. So I had this one handy uh, and I wanted to point it out to our guests, learn.openshift.com. Uh, with that said, uh, please, Mo, tell us about operators. Absolutely. So within the OpenShift cluster, there's this, um, uh, you know, kind of um, um, sort of a category, a, a, like a, a repository for you to actually find a solution. It's called the uh, the operator hub. It's a hub. It's like your, uh, if you look at your phone, you've got a, a type of a, a kind of app store, whether it's Android, iPhone, or what have you. You've got that app store. So within OpenShift, you've got the operator hub. So it is basically a way for ISVs, for you know software providers, to package their solution, no matter what solution they have, to package their solution and put it on the operator hub as an operator. And then anyone with an OpenShift cluster basically goes through the Red Hat community certification and, and basically there is like a proper system behind it to check it and, and then making it available on the operator hub. And anyone out there with an, uh, with, with a, with an OpenShift cluster they can just install that operator and make it available to all their developers who are working basically on that, using that OpenShift cluster immediately. And, and just with one click, literally with one click. And, and a good example of that is Code Ready Workspaces. It's a developer tool that makes cloud native development practical for teams using Kubernetes and containers, and basically allows you to share your workspace uh, with as easy as sharing a URL with your team member. And then the entire workspace basically becomes available to anyone out there who's basically uh, doesn't need to even go through all the installation of libraries and dependencies. And they can easily start coding from a simple web browser. You know, it's just one example. And there's so many other examples like, you know, logging tools, the, you know, Datadog and so many other things that you can actually find their operators within the operator hub. With one click, you can make it happen. So that's a very powerful feature. It's like your own app store. Uh, for as many clients out there as possible. And if they've got an OpenShift cluster, they can just install that immediately. Um, and then obviously we've got the whole cloud packs, you know, we can we can talk about that, but like, you know, some of the great features that we've got for multi-cloud, for data scientists, you know, some of the tools and services, they all can be installed with one click again from the operator hub or like, you know, what we call, you know, the cloud packs, which actually gets installed differently. But like, it, it is a, a hub for, for innovators. And obviously a lot of, uh, you know, the other solutions, uh, other competitors to, to OpenShift, they don't have that. You know, that operator is, is a way to run a service and make sure that service actually stays at a certain 
sort of you know uh, you know kind of level of uh, you know capacity and quota and and processing and it basically the operator keeps working to make that happen and keep it exactly at the, the level you desire and this is exactly the sort of um, you know innovation that stays you know is basically exists within OpenShift. And when we tell our clients and partners about it, they get absolutely fascinated. I was talking to this company. I'm, I'm not going to name the con company, but like they had this amazing solution for edge computing. And I told them about the OpenShift Operator Hub. And like a few months ago, actually, they we helped them with a, a couple of enablement sessions. And they're based in the UK. And they wanted to actually make it happen and, and put their solution out there to all OpenShift users. And they basically packaged their solutions as a uh, solution as an operator, put it on the operator hub. And now they've got thousands of users because it, it, it basically exists right there with, and with one click can be installed. And the good point is every time they make an update to their solution, it is immediately available to their clients. Their clients don't need to actually bring down the solution or put a CD or kind of put a patch and making it happen it automatically gets embedded and, and integrated all those features, all those new updates. It could be security releases, it could be security patches. And at the same time, if they've got new features, it all gets added in, in, automatically into those existing solutions. And again, in you know, right now, it's all about combining the best solutions from you know, those operators, basically combining them together and provide your solution. You don't have to rewrite things. You don't have to write things from scratch. You can definitely find part of that solution out there in the, on, on the operator hub. And then obviously with Red Hat Marketplace, you can actually even, you know, monetize that. You can easily start kind of, you know, offering your solution and get paid. Uh, you know, it's, it's a great way for ISVs to provide their solutions. You can actually make it a community-based uh, operator. So you, you can make it free of charge or you can make it enterprise and then, you know, charge your clients and customers. Again, there's the, the details can be found in the marketplace and also, um, you know, people can look for the operator hub um, and it, it is amazing. That catalog is somewhere that a lot of people, a lot of developers here are going to be absolutely delighted to visit because a lot of things they're trying to do it already exist. Just install that. I think that's a much better way. Is that, and do I have these URLs, right? Uh, the, we talked about the marketplace and is catalog.redhat.com. Is that where you would go to look more at operators? Yeah, I think so as well. Uh, I think there are a few different things you can check out there on the catalog. So we, I find this fascinating. And I think, you know, when I was doing my startup years ago, we were trying to sell to, you know, big companies and enterprise and it's, it's a real uphill battle and it's difficult. I, I don't, I don't know if my solution would have been a perfect fit for this, but I may have pivoted to something that would have been a perfect fit because anything you can do to sort of reduce that friction for adoption and make it easy for big companies, man, this is, I, I think this could really change the landscape for a lot of companies like just adding an operator for their services could could really change the game and and, and make a lot of companies viable and and making it available on all public clouds and also on prem like look at it from that sort of you know multi cloud perspective as well it's not just about running that on your own cloud it's about if you've got that solution on any other cloud that's actually becoming available to anyone out there with any any sort of public cloud and that's the, that's the power you know keeping that kind of cloud agnostic sort of, uh, you know, approach to solutions. So, so other, other, uh, folks have, um, you know, uh, uh, orchestration container management stuff like OpenShift. Um, is that what you think kind of differentiates OpenShift from the competitors, like the, um, <clears throat> the marketplace and then true like cross cloud, uh, Absolutely. portability? And also the community, Joe, like, you know, it's just, you know, uh, OpenShift has been around for, for, for many years and, and the community, it's got a very strong community. It's like that Java programming language, you know, many people uh, say, hey, Node and, and I don't know, Python and all, like, you know, they've got definitely kind of, you know, uh, there are a lot of developers out there who are basically coding in those languages. But when it comes to the community, like, you know, I would say Java has a very strong community, very strong backing. And it's the same for OpenShift. Uh, like, for instance, Google Antos and, you know, you know, Tanju from VMware and, you know, EKG Anywhere, like, you know, from AWS, they all kind of, you know, try to provide the same sort of, you know, solution to to their to their clients. But the, pro the, 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 the interesting part is, like, if you look at the communities, literally for some of them, the community is, like, non-existent. Like, you know, but when you look at the Red Hat communities and OpenShift communities, very strong out there. So many companies have already got, like, great success. There's so many great, you know, provide like, you know, 
companies in oil and gas, in banking sector, in insurance, that they're using OpenShift to not only bring that kind of boost that teamwork and, you know, kind of boost that productivity for their developers, but also for, you know, kind of to address the scalability, to have that sort of presence across multiple cloud with the same consoles and the same kind of architecture. So it, it is something that's been tested and it's been successful and it's just getting better and better. Every release, when you look at it, things are getting better. And, and that's what I would say, like, you know, it's, it's just OpenShift has that sort of edge compared to, you know, the, the rest of the, the competition. You said the word edge, which is a perfect <laughs> transition to what I wanted to ask you about next, because I know you have a background in embedded systems and IoT and you, you sort of, we were, when in our pre preparation call, we were talking about how important edge is and, and what's sort of on the horizon. Maybe we could shift gears and talk a little bit about that. Oh, what, what's on the edge of edge? Is that, where you, is that what the horizon, what you meant? So, you know, yeah. it, it is actually getting quite interesting because, um, you know, compute, they're trying to kind of, you know, bring that sort of compute into the field now. Like we used to have like lots of sensors and, and actuators out there in the field for agricultural purposes, for security, for so many applications. And it was always about capturing that data and then, you know, kind of uploading that to a, a cloud uh, and, and then, you know, kind of, you know, mining that data and then making some, you know, driving some meaning out of it and then act on it. But obviously that comes with a lot of disadvantages too, that latency. If you are, you know, working with critical, you know, mission critical applications, you don't want to have that latency in place. You want to be able to capture data right in the field apply the the sort of you know compute and and the sort of analytics that you want on the data right in the field and then you know make some actions in most cases so recently what's been happening is quite interesting it's like you can actually capture data you can build your model in the cloud or on your edge devices in the field and then you know that model training data and making that model you can actually run inference even in a very energy efficient way and again, OpenShift and, and you know, some forms of Kubernetes, those are great, great solutions, you know, platforms out there to make that happen. Like, you know, a lot of agricultural, like, you know, applications, what they're trying to do is like capturing a lot of data, of, you know, with respect to the soil, you know, to the soil moisture or the sort of, you know, kind of, you know, insects and, you know, lots of other factors that could actually, you know, affect the, the sort of plants and, and, and the, the, the produce. And what they do is cap by capturing that data and analyzing that data in the field, they can make it so, like they can make a decision immediately by sending a drone to kind of, you know, spread some sort of chemicals to kind of get rid of those kind of, you know, insects or, you know, some sort of a species. Like, you know, that's what they're doing these days. And it's, it's quite interesting. And the same goes for oil and gas. Like, you know, lots of sensors on the platforms, you know, they they, they look at the construction, the, the sort of, uh, you know, structure to see like, you know, how things are basically playing out and they make decisions right in the field. And obviously for security, which I think is the best example, it's like, you know, you look for some anomaly, some inexplicable behavior. If there's like, you know, something happening in a parking lot at night, you know, you need to have those cameras to be able to uh, generate some alerts basically automatically to the authorities rather than someone in the back end, like, you know, you know, 20 kilometers away, kind of, you know, watching some monitors, whether he or she can actually capture that sort of you know, uh, you know, events happening. Like, you know, you can actually have cameras out there that they do those things automatically by kind of, you know, looking at the, like, you know, by training data, using the models to make sure that if there are anything interesting that basically they need to alert the authorities. And that's basically the power of edge by bringing a compute and that kind of processing closer to the field. So you don't have to have the, the you know, the, the sort of, you know, communication to cloud all the time. From a different perspective, it's all about energy consumption as well. When you have a lot of, uh, you know, kind of communication with public cloud, you need to have actually like some sort of satellite communication or have like, you know, cellular communication, Wi-Fi communication, what have you. It's just, you need to actually, you know, kind of reduce that. If you've got your devices running on batteries or some sort of solar cells, you need to actually have like a, you know, kind of reduced power consumption. And by running things on, uh, on the edge, uh, you basically minimize the number of communications and you just can use that power to kind of, you know, process data rather than just, you know, communicate. Because communication is the one that takes the, you know, kind of the, the most amount of energy. Uh, and, and there's so many, so many other reasons and, you know, why this, you know, edge is actually becoming important. I'm quite fascinated. I've got my, you know, Raspberry Pi cluster right behind me. Like, shall, shall I show you? <laughs> you know, that's my cluster of 120 Raspberry Pis right there. Wow. Very so those, interesting. Um, you know, four Raspberry Pi zeros on on top of a Raspberry Pi four, 
and I've got like a cluster of them now. It's just, and I can send a, a message, uh, a, a task to this, and then they basically run their own sort of edge processing in each one of them. And then they work together as a coalition formation to make something happen. Again, it is still experimental. I'm doing a lot of uh, kind of, you know, coding on the side, but you know, Joe, and look, you know, the, you know, my, my time is very limited, so I don't get much time to do that. So I'm still on the, um, you know, cluster of four. So I'm not trying to do much on the 120. That is cool. We could do a whole show on on just that. Your cluster behind you—that would be fun. Yeah, yeah it's th fascinating stuff. And I loved your analogies or your explanation of agriculture. I'm actually kind of dabbling in in agriculture myself. I'm next week. I'm buying 23 acres down the road, and we're we're going to do like permaculture agroforestry setup. And I'm scheming already. I know how hard it is to protect just my backyard here. I've got groundhogs and possums and birds and all of these things coming so i'm experimenting already starting to to scheme about how to do this and exactly what you said I, i'm going to try there's the sony's presence board which i know can do it but i'm also going to try to do it with um uh, the esp uh i chips so little cameras and basically like you're saying run computer vision on on these uh, small low power boards see if i can detect you know raccoons groundhogs possums coyotes deer awesome. and then Here's my plan. Hopefully this this will work out. Uh, it's not that far, so I think I can do like a a, a LoRa uh, either network or just uplink. So I'll have this low power system doing edge detection and then just sending that small bit of metadata. Hey, at, at X Y Z camera, I saw a groundhog. And then now it gets really crazy. Now can I have some sort of like robotic scarecrow scare it away? Do I get a real dog and then have some sort of I could train the dog. To like go to the whistling sound of the appropriate, uh, you know, node within this system. So, you know, the, I mean, I know I'm I'm rambling a bit here, but I'm very excited to like have a little experimental place to try some of these edge scenarios on. That that all sounds really. You can do a lot with those sheepdogs too. I've seen different whistles. They'll go left, right. They'll put some ducks in a in a in a bin or whatever. So that's there's there's you, you can do that. So university, I think it was, or maybe it was Georgia Tech. They had a, a system they built for uh, a dog to have a vest that had a cell phone with a little cord. And especially when they're looking for, this is a very specific scenario. When you're doing search and rescue, most cases you find the person and the dog could go and, and bring people back and they would stay there. But if you're looking for, say, an autistic child, this may not they, they may continue to hide they may not want to be found so the dog was actually trained to go find who they're looking for stay with them but make a little cell phone call back so the dog act you can actually train the dog to make a cell phone call that is pretty amazing i you know i want to use this opportunity because we're talking about luke's backyard but but um also you know edge in space uh oh, one of yeah. our early guests was naeem right is naeem coming back is that what i remember we, yes, we're going to schedule him, I think, for in November. We'll have Naeem back on. Okay, so so stay tuned for that. Naeem's going to come back and talk about uh, space tech and uh, computing in space and all that stuff. That'll be a lot of fun. And, and you know, Luke mentioned uh, Laura Network. So he, he, in London, I, I think I've mentioned that in, in, in many of my, my talks, basically. So in London, back at Intel, we had this uh, amazing network in the Olympic Park. And and that basically was like a receiver, a Laura receiver. And, you know, Joe, uh, if you familiar with LoRa, you can actually uh, capture data. You can actually capture data in 20 uh, kilometer radius. So it's just a single receiver. It's a very you know long range. It's like it's one of those low power wide area you know network technologies that can you know does a lot basically. So yeah. you had one receiver and a lot of sensors, microclimate sensors, you know, to capture you know data on temperature, humidity, light level, etc. And then we also had the bat sensors, and the bat sensors are quite interesting because bats are good indicators of biodiversity of an environment. And the ecologists in the park told us we, we would love to capture bat calls. Like, yeah, bats actually have stress calls, they have social calls, they're like humans. And that basically by capturing that. We could basically see what's happening in that area. Is that healthy enough? Is that you know polluted? You know those kind of things that they were interested in. And we had all these devices running these models against you know bat species, so we could actually see what sort of a species like these bats are. You know what sort of calls they 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 have, and then also looking at the microclimate data and then capturing all that. And then our box, you know, I've got a paper on that. It was actually quite a smart. So you could switch between LoRa to you know to 802.15.4 to 
Bluetooth even through people's phones, like you know, in the park or visiting, because they had to have the apps, you know, uh, to capture that data, and also through Wi-Fi and cellular. So you could easily kind of you know decide the box was smart enough to decide how it wants to send the data. And and again, LoRa was actually a great technology. And again, it's it's just being used. In, like I've got so many LoRa devices here in my you know, back garden, you know, capturing data about the soil moisture and everything. It's, it is definitely something that we need to talk about it, like you know, separate show and you know, call it the IET Edge show. Yeah, I think we should definitely do an IoT Edge show and tell. Uh, and, you know, we could definitely do a one off. But I, I know within our community, we have so many, uh, you know, besides doing enterprise stuff, folks are doing all kinds of interesting just side projects. I know John Wallachy and oh, Glenn yeah. uh, Darling and and who's going to be a guest later this month. Uh, it would be, Yeah, that would be really interesting. Yeah, um, we should, we have a whole panel of folks, and we can all just you know share what we're doing, and 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 uh, yeah, I would love to go through that. That'd be really cool. Awesome. We are getting close to the edge of time, so you know, Mo, is there anything we didn't ask you that we should have, or a any uh, any other things that you're excited about that you want to mention? I'm excited. Actually, next week is my first business travel after nearly 18 months. Um, I'll wow. be off to Munich, Germany for our leadership oh. team meeting uh, to meet with my EMEA boss and my peers, uh, many of whom I haven't actually met in person yet. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. Uh, the other thing is like, um, you know, you're basically starting to go back to the office. Um, and it's just like, I don't think we haven't actually mastered how to transition back into the office setting. Um, you know, that's a little bit, you know, kind of taking, you know, I think about it all the time. We've kind of got used to this kind of working remotely, having developed this new habit to keep us productive and focused working from home. And now we are going back to that old setting and, and our productivity may suffer initially. Um, I, I, I say we should definitely continue with some of our good habits. So that's what I'm going to definitely try to do, try to fit them in. Like, you know, you know, for instance, I started going for, for, for an afternoon jog around the block, you know, and, and, and I'm keen to keep that habit. And I'm sure I can find some time you know, before my lunch break when, whenever I'm walking from the office. But, you know, having that face-to-face -face contact and, and touch really matter. In fact, that increases, uh, you know, the levels of dopamine and serotonin. You know, those are the two neurotransmitters that you know, regulate our mood and relieve stress and anxiety. I'm, I'm quite excited to, you know, go back to the office. And I think one of the important lessons of the pandemic was realizing the value of togetherness, you know, whether with the family and friends or even at work. So I'm, I'm actually quite excited about all that. Sounds good. I'm, I'm hoping that we didn't leave like any like lunch in the refrigerator or that coffee cup <laughs> on the table for 18 months. It could be, could be really disgusting. I do have one thing I wanted to ask you, Mo. Have you ever been up to uh, Bleckley Park and the National Museum of Computing. Have you ever? Yes, it's yes. just outside of London. It's absolutely amazing. I encourage everyone to. Yeah. I completely. When we were talking about uh, computers in the beginning of the show, it came to mind because last time I was in London, which was like three years ago or something, my wife took me there, and wow, what an amazing absolutely. place! If yeah. and it it it's that nostalgia trip because I I feel like you know we've all lived these parallel lives whether it was that Pentium or the Commodore or the you know PC Junior I actually have a friend who is cornering the market on PC Junior circuit boards in Texas right now there's like this warehouse you could go buy antiquated computers and he's just buying tons of these things cuz he's you know again that that feeling of nostalgia from when he was a, a child but you go to this National Museum of Computing and they have like everything and the recreations of you know, it's amazing you know, next time you should take me to your countryside, like, you know, to your back garden and all the great places you mentioned. And then when you come to London, I'll take you to some of those great places again. I know Joe is actually much, mostly interested in, you know, beaches and, you know, kind of sunshine and you know, not, not in the city. But Joe, I promise you it would be a great, great visit. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm happy that you're traveling. I look forward to traveling in the not too distant future as well, assuming that, you know, the world can kind of right itself to some extent. Um, and I would love to come out to London again. I haven't been to that museum, but it sounds fascinating. It's amazing. Yeah. And, yeah. and maybe we'll go to a rock club or something, too. That would be fun. Sure. Awesome. Cool. London has something for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All Very right. cool. This has been a fantastic conversation, Mo. Thank you for joining us. Thank uh, you for having me. It was great. It was a great conversation. And again, great to see you, like, you know, having this conversation. Yeah, I look forward to the next ones, hopefully. Places. Yep. Sounds good. I look forward to it, too. Awesome. All right. Take care. Have a great weekend. Cheers. Bye-bye.
Bye.